Welcome to the Headless WP Podcast. I am our host, Jeff Everhart, and I'm joined today, as always, by my excellent co-host, Fran, the Stokeman Agalto. And today we have two excellent guests joining us today from a company called Stellate. We have Max Stoiber, who is the co-founder of this company, and Thomas Hayenbrock, who is uh, an engineer at Stellate. Hey guys, super excited to be here. Hey folks. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for coming on. I gotta Should tell I you guys, I'm I was a big fan of y'all. And when I reached out to Max, who was so kind, and it's funny because you know, I think there is something to be said. Look, look, we all as devs use Twitter. And I, I know, look, it's social media, and sometimes there's some negativity on Twitter, but let me tell you something. Developers and developer relationships. Actually, I've had all positive experiences from people like Max, who you just, if you reach out to and kindly say, hey, we would like some content or share ideas. I'm telling you, that's the that, that's one of the powers and positive, positivity of Twitter. So thank you, Max, for being so kind. Of course. <laughs> yeah. I would actually say, I would go a step further. I would say pretty much my entire career is based on the relationships I've built on Twitter. It's really been yeah. a huge boon for my career because I've gotten to know people from all around the globe that are doing interesting things in this space. And it's helped me stay up to date with what's happening and what's going on and who's, done, who's doing what for the last, you know, almost 10 years now. It's, it's been a long time that I've been on there and I, I love it, honestly. So yeah. kids, so, subscribe. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Kids breaking into developer engineering, software engineering. You heard it from Max in our previous episode. Lee Robinson at Vercel even said it. Use Twitter. Elon Musk, buy it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, joking, joking. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, if we, we can start getting into it, y'all. So maybe you all could start by just kind of giving us a little bit of background on yourselves and how, how your sort of web development journey brought you to Stellate. Sure. Um, I'll just uh, I'll just start then. Um, so, um, like my journey into into web development, basically, uh, it's an interesting one. I started out studying maths, and okay. oh. over over time, I somehow got into uh, data science, um, oh, nice. and also like this this came with some programming with it. And the company I was uh, working at at the moment also did a lot of web development. And so uh, over time, I drifted into that direction. And uh, now somehow I ended up uh, at Stellate um, <laughs> as one of the first employees, uh, engineers, uh, as engineer. And um, yeah, doing pretty much uh, full stack front to back uh, and even building uh, stuff in PHP, PHP apparently, oh. um, for oh, WordPress. OK, very cool. That is cool. Man, it's always great to hear people when they're like, I was doing this other thing and then just sort of ended up here because that always is a signifier to me yeah. that like you were passionate about this stuff enough to just kind of go and, you know, ignore some total other career path, which is great. Thomas, I'm terrible at PHP. Maybe you can give me some snippets. <laughs> on some. <laughs> I'm trying to turn you know, into an OAuth provider. So, maybe... <laughs> oh, man. You know, I'm, I'm terrible at PHP, too. Uh, I just started again when we wrote the, our WordPress integration. And I really had to to dig deep to to get back all the, the knowledge. That I, like, when I started out, I did some PHP, like, um, was... Uh, or it still is very popular and uh, very widely used. So um, it's hard to get get around without yeah, touching it. Yeah, I think ever. PHP but... is like the cockroach of programming languages. <laughs> like maybe like COBOL in a way, where Ooh, just like you, you will never you will never kill PHP. Oh. Like it's not going to happen. <laughs> and it does seem Probably, to keep yeah. getting better. Like I, I revisit it every couple of years, and I'm like, oh, this looks nice, and like you know, it oh, is. This is fast. I now, haven't used it faster. for. I haven't. I haven't used it for a couple of years, and I was positively uh, surprised by um, that it actually like didn't feel that horrible how I remembered it from oh. my my early days. Yeah. Like yeah. horrible yeah. because probably I didn't know how to code properly back then as well. But yeah, <clears throat> and I, I think there was a lot of valid criticism for some of the earlier versions of PHP, but <laughs> since like seven and now eight, it's starting to look a lot better. Um, but that's that's awesome, Thomas. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for giving us, Max. What what about you? What kind of background could you give us, and how did that bring you to Stellate? 
Great question. So I didn't study maths, uh, but I'm a software engineer by trade. I, I got into software engineering through really high school. We did like this, I'm not even going to call it computer science class. I think that that would be a little bit far-fetched. It was more like an IT class, right? Like they taught us how to use Excel. They taught us how to use Word. Okay. taught us how to use computers, like all of the basic stuff that you really need to do on a computer. And as part of that, they also taught us a tiny bit of HTML and CSS to create sort of like a personal website for oneself. So every pupil at the school had to make a personal website that was oh, sort of wow. posted as oh. a sub website of the main website. And you could click through all of all the people's personal websites and they will tell you their name and their age. And there wasn't really much more to say. And so everybody kind of just played around a little bit. And so I spent an inordinate amounts of time just making the ugliest personal website you can think of. Like, you know, like every classic <laughs> yes. thing you can think of, like black, black background, green text, comic sans, like mm -hmm. anime, like gifs everywhere. Like the whole thing yeah. was absolutely terrible. But I had so much fun playing around with that, that I, that I just kept doing it and really what I, I always say I've just never stopped making websites right and that's really where my career started I eventually got into open source and javascript a little bit I did a lot of um, open source projects in the react ecosystem like react boilerplate oh, wow. and style components yeah. and a bunch of stuff there that uh, got quite popular and worked at a bunch of different companies and really co-founded Stellate because when I've I I'd, I'd founded a company before that was called Spectrum that got eventually got acquired by GitHub and with huge scaling pro problems at that company. And we were trying to build sort of a modern take on a community forum. It eventually turned into GitHub discussions, if you've seen those. And mm -hmm. with huge scaling problems, because we were growing really well. But the problem was we were using GraphQL for our API layer, which we loved, huge fans of GraphQL. That worked out amazingly. But we couldn't cache our GraphQL API at all. And so in order to solve our scaling problems, we had to spend a whole bunch of time re-architecting a lot of how our database works and how our, our, our servers were hosted instead of just being able to move faster on product. And so when I eventually met Tim, my co-founder, and he showed me that he built a prototype of this graphical edge cache, I was like, no way. That is exactly <laughs> what I would have needed at my last company. We are still doing this. And so that's really how I came here and why I co-founded Stelly. That is okay. That wild. is awesome. What yep. a cool Indefinitely. For sure. And definitely, if you haven't, we'll, we'll include a link to Max's website and check out some of the open source projects he's worked on, because chances are you've you've used it either as a developer or you've uh, <laughs> encountered a website that is using it for sure. <laughs> um, but that's all fantastic background. And so that sort of leads us into maybe our next good question. Uh, so, like, could you give us an overview of the Stella product as it yeah. stands today and then what it delivers for those developers who use GraphQL as their API layer? Sure. Um, I think the the core product that we have built uh, is uh, is the thing that we call the GraphQL Edge Cache, um, which basically like GraphQL isn't really it doesn't work well with traditional CDN systems uh, where you can cache different endpoints uh, using like standard HTTP caching. It doesn't really work with GraphQL as you just have one endpoint and uh, like it returns totally different data depending on the query that you send it. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, um, we took that problem and made a CDN that is able to cache uh, GraphQL requests. Um, and you can configure it uh, by specifying rules, basically saying, I want this type to be cached for this long, or this field uh, should be oh. cached for uh, one day, the other field like for, I don't know, a month. So. Um, also giving you the, the flexibility to make it fit with your use case because like um, depending on what kind of product that you build, um, you might have very different uh, requirements for, for your caching. Um, awesome. And that's, that's like the, the main product, I'd say. And around this product, we also build uh, very powerful GraphQL analytics. Um, and yes. funny, funny enough, we actually um, are just building out uh, like our second version of, uh, of our dashboard, um, which will like officially launch very soon, um, which will or, like basically, since we're in a position where every request goes through our system, we are already aware and can tell you a lot about your usage uh, of your GraphQL API. Um, yeah. And also wow. about caching, but also about uh, in general like errors, and uh, we can we are also doing like some ba basic alerting where you can say if I see some spike in in an error rate, I get automated emails or select notifications or stuff like that. Oh, and yeah, that's that's basically the two products that we have today. It's the late. 
So awesome. There's a lot to dig in. Uh, Fran, I know you're chomping. So go I'm chomping at the bits here I... because, like, yeah, just real quick on a side question of the product, right? And I'm going to ask this from the web developer that's a little bit new getting into web development, mm -hmm. right? So, Max Thomas, you, either one of you can answer this. The first question I have is walk me through, say I'm a, I, I'm a new web developer. Maybe I'm using um, WordPress as my data source, let's just say for, for um, smiles and giggles because we're on the head of WordPress podcast. Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, I'm like thinking, man, I don't want to bang my WordPress server that much. So I'll cache my GraphQL queries at the edge. In Stellate, is there like in the UI or the UI, sorry, the GUI, um, where would I put like, how would I get my head wrapped around? Okay, how do I cache and validate my GraphQL query? That's my first question. So there's like for, for how to configure caching, you can set up, uh, like we call it rules, um, where you define a rule and say this rule applies to um, these types and fields from my schema. So for example, in the WordPress case, the most common type is probably the post type. So um, I define a rule where I say, I want my post type to be cached for, I don't know, maybe um, one day or one hour, depending on how often I, uh, my, my blog actually updates and I add new posts. Um, for invalidation, there are actually two ways how you can uh, invalidate the cache. Yeah. Um, the one way is uh, what we call automated cache invalidation um, because our edge caching is smart enough to see that if a mutation runs through our, uh, our CDN, um, then we automatically figure out, okay, uh, what has been changed uh, through this mutation, which is, like, which is awesome because GraphQL allows us to do this because GraphQL is strongly typed. And just by looking at the query and the response, we can figure out, okay, um, post with ID uh, 42 has now changed, so I need to purge the cache for it. Um, so we are doing part of this uh, automatically if you use mutations to update your data. But we also, uh, to give you like the full flexibility, um, because like not all the updates, especially in the WordPress case, happen through mutations or through your GraphQL API. There might be other sources, like you go into the WordPress dashboard and just uh, up your post, uh, update your blog post there. So we also have a purging API that you can use to programmatically invalidate the cache, uh, which awesome. gives you a lot of entry points for the different <clears throat> types and uh, in your schema. Um, so yeah, man, man. hope that answers yeah. the question. And then and for, the, for, the WordPress case, <laughs> for, the, for the WordPress case specifically, we actually worked on an integration. So there's a WordPress plugin that you can install and essentially what that does for you is it listens to any changes on any data type that you have in your WordPress setup. So for example, again, let's to go back to the blog post example. Imagine if you edit the title of your blog post in your CMS, the plugin will go ahead and even though that change was made not through GraphQL, but through the dashboard, it will go ahead and it will ping our purging API and will say, hey, that post was just changed. You got to invalidate any query that contains that specific post. Right now, please. And the thing that makes our GraphQL edge cache special, I think that a lot of our customers appreciate is that we can invalidate stale query results really, really, really quickly. So if you ping us and say, hey, the post with the ID 42 has changed right now, within 150 milliseconds, any cached query result that contains that blog post from our over 60 or 70 locations globally is gone. Wow. And so whenever the data changes, it, you can just purge it pretty much instantly like that. And it'll be reflected worldwide and all the updates will, will be visible to your users. And that's a really powerful and something that a lot of our users really appreciate because they can cache a lot more data. That is so mm. huge, especially like say I'm like a huge, e even a mid-level e-com business and it's like, yeah. I don't know, Black Friday or something. Yep. Oh, dude. Yeah, dude, that's yep. sick. Nice, Max. Yeah. Tell and it is, it's it's amazing. And so I will, I, I've definitely used your all's product on a couple of different sites. Um, and so I can attest to how easy it is to integrate where it's really just like, I give you all, you know, I go in, here's my GraphQL API. You give me back kind of like a URL to point to instead. And I drop that in my application code and it's, it's there. And so like to know it was already sort of that simple. And then to know that you've kind of created this WordPress plugin that makes, uh, 
additional pieces of that even simpler is fantastic. But so I kind of wanted to loop back a little bit and just maybe like dig into some details. And so the first thing I'll, I'll lead with is just a statement about your analytics service. And I do think that's a really helpful thing for users where I've actually, you know, m- maybe they don't necessarily need a full-blown CDN for what they're doing, but for whatever reason, their application is requesting too many pages or posts and is breaking their server. And so I've actually recommended that to people to just turn on, like give you this level of introspection to see what's happening, to see where maybe you're making too many queries or like what it benefits you to do this. And so that on its own is a really helpful tool, I think for people. But I kind of want to go back and Thomas, this this was something you said, and maybe just unpack this a little bit for our users who might be uh, newer to this space and are coming from like a REST API background. So you mentioned that kind of GraphQL is something that's hard to cache. Could you get into why that is? And like, do you think it's harder to cache than stuff from a REST API? And what's what's the difference there? Uh, I think the difference is for like, you have uh, HTTP caching, which is like, that's that's built into the protocol. Um, and a like, this is basically um, scoped to an endpoint. Like you call a URL, um, mm-hmm. And the URL can respond with, hey, um, you can cache my data for, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes. Um, and then if you come back later, um, then please fetch the, fetch the new data. Um, so this is like the traditional HTTP caching, which works very well with REST APIs, because in REST, you have like one endpoint for each kind of uh, like data type or entity that you are fetching. Um, in GraphQL, there are two problems with this. Um, the first one is you only have one endpoint. Um, <laughs> yes, so you of don't. So like already here, like HTTP caching breaks down, um, doesn't really work anymore because this one endpoint returns um, like totally different data depending on what query you send to your GraphQL API. And the second thing is, um, which is also kind of a limitation of HTTP caching, um, you can't really cache post requests. And you can use GraphQL with uh, GET requests or something like something more advanced like persistent queries, um, but the the main standard in GraphQL is just like using POST requests. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think these are the two main um, problems that that prevent you from using traditional HTTP caching. And in terms of edge caching, most edge providers like use the HTTP caching spec, spec for uh, their implementations, which uh, doesn't, uh, as I explained now, really work with GraphQL. And that's that's how Stellate, uh, that's where Stellate tried to fill the gap um, and provide a more tailored edge caching solution that works specifically for GraphQL APIs. Awesome. Yes, and those are those are fantastic details. And I guess we can see why, you know, like post requests in a traditional REST API model are hard to cache, right? So typically those mean like we're changing something. So, exactly. you know, that's, that's not a cacheable thing. Can I, I'm just going to ask a, like a side question. I just want to fact check myself because like I'm that developer nerd that researches every single history. I know Facebook invented React because their app <laughs> just got so big. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark Zuckerberg. I guess, but um, <laughs> but do they well, also? Well, Fran, they're, they're meta now. They're, they're meta. meta. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They rebranded <laughs> Meta, which could segue into our question about you rebranding. But yeah, um, oh great. <laughs> <laughs> quick, real quick. GraphQL was invented by Facebook as well. Yes, or Meta? Meta? Yes. So Interesting. Yes. Facebook invented Interesting. GraphQL back in 2012, I think, and they were building their mobile apps at the time. And they were heavily using the REST API to fetch data. The problem is, if you imagine the Facebook, just the, even the Facebook feed, right? Like you're loading a set yeah. of five posts, you're loading the current user for every post, you're loading the author, the comment count, the like count. You're fetching a whole bunch of data just to display that one view. And they realized they had this waterfall problem where they ended up going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between the server and the mobile app many times to fetch all of that data. And so... They, they sat down and they were like, how can we actually rethink our data fetching? And so essentially what GraphQL does, right, it, it, is it turns your entire data into a graph. And then you can write this, this query that just defines what data you want. You can literally just say, you know, I want the 
five posts from your feed. For every post, give me the body and the create that date, and then also give me the author, the name and the avatar of the author, and then also maybe the comment count and the like count. I'm just gonna add that onto there. And you can send that definition of the data you want to the server. And really what GraphQL does is it's a, it's a smart, efficient resolver that takes that definition of data and, and on the server helps you resolve it as quickly as possible and send it back to the client. And that's really where it came from. And eventually, Facebook really open sourced this GraphQL layer, I think, in uh, framework in uh, 2014, the, the GraphQL JS reference oh, implementation. Okay. Um, but GraphQL is just a slice of their stack, right? They've got a huge stack surrounding GraphQL. They've got a data access layer in the back, in, in, in the back of it called Int. They have a lot of edge technologies in front of it that they custom built for GraphQL. And so nobody else in the industry really has anything other than that one Pretty useful slice, to be honest, of technology because graphic is awesome, <laughs> mm -hmm. but everything else kind of doesn't exist, right? And so really, I think what's the way I look at Celia is that we take some of the technology that, that companies need and big companies build this stuff in-house, right? Like the really big companies using GraphQL that need edge caching, they've built their own edge caching internally. But everybody else that doesn't have the time to do that, that's what we build it for, right? And the same thing is true for our analytics. And, I, and, I, and that's, that's the power and the value of companies like yours Max and WP Engine, where we abstract that operational layer that I don't have to spin this up as a developer. It's just there at the edge for me. And I can just get push and code, right? And then I set I set my parameters and settings in a GUI and boom, right there, I'm, I'm off to the races. So I, I, that's absolutely wonderful. I don't know, Jeff, if you want to ask that segue question because I'm- No, dying. go for it. You, br you brought it up. Okay, because I'm dying to know y'all. Oh, yeah. Here's Here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? And I, I the name Stellate is awesome, but Graph CDN is pretty sick, man. <laughs> like I, I love that name. So can you tell me first how? I mean, obviously Graph CDN is obvious, but then the move over to Stellate. How? I mean, what what was the motivation or inspiration behind that, uh, Max? That's a lovely question. Well. Um... Where do I even start the story? Well, we originally <laughs> chose the name Graph CDN because if you are a graphical edge cache, that name makes total sense, right? Like if, mm -hmm. if that's your main product, you're set, right? Like Graph CDN communicates that really well, we thought. Then we started talking to some of our users and we realized that people deeply associate CDNs with static content, right? When, when, when you say CDN, they think of like a cloud in area serving image assets, right? They think of like the CDN serving your HTML and CSS, your static assets to the browser. But the fact that we can cache really highly dynamic graphical data just wasn't obvious to people, right? They were like, your graph QL CDN, that's cool, but my data changes constantly, right? Like how, how I'm not gonna be able to cache that, right? It's, it's, it's not static content. We can't just serve some files from a CDN somewhere. It's highly dynamic JSON data that is actually changes very often. So that was the first problem. We realized that the whole CDN branding kind of made it difficult for people to understand that we can actually cache their graph APIs. And then the second part of it, that alone wouldn't have been enough for, for, for us to change, change, make us change our entire company name. But the second part is that we were talking to a lot of our customers and we realized they have a whole bunch of problems surrounding their graph APIs that have really nothing to do with a CDN that we would absolutely love to solve. So to give you a really common example, we hear a lot that companies struggle with schema evolution. Once you're in production with your graphical API, essentially at any given moment, you're migrating some parts of your schema, you're changing some parts of your schema. Mm -hmm. It very rarely stays static. But the way GraphQL works made, makes the schema evolution really, really difficult. And so we keep hearing this problem over and over and we're like, well, we have some ideas and we would love to go into and solve that problem but that has nothing to do with the CDN, right? That is not something that a CDN would ever do. That name is way too limiting for what we're actually doing, which is solving problems in the GraphQL space. And so really we, we went, we sat down with the whole team and we were like, look, we, we got to kind of rename this company to a name that allows us to solve more problems that we see that aren't just specific to a CDN. And so that's really why we rebranded to Stelly. We were like, we love the name Graph CDN for being able to communicate that we do GraphQL caching. We yeah. Don't like it for the fact that it limits us in what we can do and that it limits how people perceive us externally because they associate mm -hmm. us with traditional CDNs. And so that's really <clears> why we rebranded to Stelly. As much as I love the name Graph CDN myself, and let me tell you, it was a pain in the butt to rename everything. Yeah. That no, was a huge sure. effort by our whole yeah. community team, as, as Thomas can attest. We had to rename everything across the board. That was so much Crap. work, but we knew we had to do it in order to just unlock ourselves to be able to solve more problems in the future. Max, what? Okay, so stellate means. Uh, you might have said it. Uh, say it again. What does it actually mean? Like by so, definition. 
stellate is an English word that, that I actually honestly didn't know before we embarked on this whole renaming journey. And it means star shaped, which felt really apt because okay. graphs, if you Whoa. think about a graph, every single oh. node in a graph with its edges kind of looks like a star, a star. right? Yeah. And so we're like, yeah. man, graph, star, star shaped. Wow. Oh, that makes total sense. And it's a very generic name, right? Like I said, but we're looking for something that would let us solve any problem we want without limiting us in the opportunities we could see. And so Stellate is very much on purpose, kind of a generic name that doesn't really mean anything per se. It, it means star shape, but that's about it, right? It doesn't limit us at all anymore. You know what it made me think about just now? And I got to tell you guys, for those of you that know American playwrights, there was a play called Streetcar Named Desire. And the lead... Oh, Stella. Stella! Stella! Yeah. Marlon Brando shouting... So when yeah. I cash my GraphQL queries at the Stella, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. anyway, sorry, Tennessee. That's will fantastic. <laughs> and there's some, yeah. Let me so let me pull out one nugget that I of what Max just said that I think we could sort of unpack for our listeners. So you talked about what was it? Sch schema change. How did you phrase yeah. that? Schema migration. Because I, I schema migration, and I think that's a really interesting problem. And and you see that kind of pop up in a number of different things. Uh, Kellen Mace, our, our developer relations manager, and I were talking about this the other day because we were like, what's MongoDB doing now? Like, I haven't really heard anything about MongoDB, but I kind of feel like that idea of this ever evolving schema was one of the things that made sort of those uh, JSON document databases sort of popular back when they, when they came out. And I feel like now other people are also sort of solving that problem. Uh, maybe it's planet scale. They've kind of got version databases and you can do these sort of migrations really easily. And so I think that's interesting that y'all are thinking about uh, tackling that as well. Um, but it's cool but to see that, oh, really, sorry, go ahead. Really, if you're at a big company and you have many teams working on your GraphQL schema, you're constantly changing something. Now, Facebook has this, um, I guess, rule internally that they don't make any breaking changes to their GraphQL schema. So their GraphQL schema always stays the same. They only deprecate things and then add new things to it, which is great. Except when you have an API that's used by many, many consumers, when you have an API that's used by potentially 50 different product teams for different mobile apps, web apps, websites, and then maybe even you expose it to the outside world, you have other developers integrate with your graphical mm -hmm. API, suddenly it's very difficult to evolve your schema because somebody somewhere is going to be using that part of the schema that you wrote 10, 10 years ago, or let's say five years ago, that it, that will still be used by somebody. Somebody will be sending queries to it. And then you can't really change it. You can't really remove that part of the schema without breaking their experience. And so that's something we hear over and over again from bigger companies using GraphQL. As soon as you're using GraphQL in production, essentially 24 seven, there's some part of your schema that you're having to migrate, that you're having to change, where you're having to manage deprecations, that where you're having to manage new fields being introduced, old fields being re removed. And so that whole management workflow is one that comes up over and over again as a big pain point for companies using GraphQL. Awesome. Well, we, I definitely look forward to seeing what that the tooling around that looks like. Me too. Um, and also, <laughs> yeah. This is yeah. all very future facing stuff. So uh, <laughs> we'll see what we you do. You heard it there. here first. No, I mean, not, <laughs> not first, but we're, we like we like scoops. Uh, Fran, you want to take that number four too? Yeah. So, um, not, so th this question lies on like, okay, let, there's a lot of companies working on, on unifying the content layer, right, around GraphQL in varying ways. Um, what I guess like, and number four is like kind of like a real broad question, but what makes in your own opinions, Thomas and Max, and trust me, developers have a lot of opinions, especially on mm -hmm. front end. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what makes uh, Stella unique in this, in this space, in your opinion? So the way we think about this is that um, first, what we're doing right now is we're strengthening individual graphs. We're giving more companies the tools they need in order to use GraphQL in production. And like we were talking about earlier, really what GraphQL does is it turns your data from a list of just arbitrary endpoints in a REST world into a graph of your data that you can just traverse any which way you want. And you can define what data you need, send it to the server, the server resolves it and sends it back to the client. And if you think about a world in which, imagine a world in which every company for every piece of their data is using GraphQL. So all of these companies, every company has their own sort of siloed graph of their data that they need for, for their systems to work. But really the huge opportunity is what if we can go ahead and actually then connect all of those APIs together, right? Because all of that data is related somewhere. That user you have in your WordPress database is the same as the user you have in your billing system in Stripe maybe is, is the same as the user you have 
in your Salesforce instance from, from your CRM, right? All of that data is linked somehow, but no one's really linking it together. And so software engineers often spend a whole bunch of time just linking together disparate data sources, signing up for the Stripe API, getting that access token, storing it in an end variable, trying to figure out which API to fetch, trying to figure out how to store their user ID, then connecting that to the user that we, they have in the database, right? Using that in the script, just so much of this integration work is just connecting these disparate data sources together and trying to make sure that you're getting the right data from the right place. And so what we're really doing is right now we're enabling more companies to use GraphQL. And then down the line, once a lot of them are using GraphQL, we'll make sure to connect all of them together into what we call the global data graph, into the graph of pretty much all of the world's data, hopefully, at some point. Now, of course, that's a utopia, right? Not every company is ever <laughs> going to use GraphQL exclusively, but its adoption is growing really, really quickly. And we believe that if we, if we can build the tooling that solves the problems that the companies face around GraphQL, more of them are going to use GraphQL, and eventually we're going to have more data in the global data graph. Max, I, I think that is actually, you nailed every point in my, in my humble, honest opinion. And this actually, I had a um, fireside chat with my buddy over at Netlify, Mr. Sean Grove. Mm. And yeah, Sean, Sean is mind blowing. <laughs> if you ever sit down and I'm talking, he, he just starts rattling off. He's, he's, he's a genius. But anyway, he told me the the beauty of it's literally what just came out of your mouth is the unification of how API, all different data layers are snowflakes, right? But eventually, and him and I agreed at the end of our conversation that he he believes eventually that all all most organizations and eventually all will adapt GraphQL and rest will be will be minuscule. And I know that's controversial maybe to say because there's all these blogs about blog posts about rest versus GraphQL trade-offs and stuff. But with companies like yours closing that gap so that there is no more parity, it's just like, oh, there there you you your decisions made, Mr. Developer, you you go GraphQL API. Rest, what is what is that? You know what I'm saying? So yeah, anyway. I think that's the beauty of GraphQL, the developer experience. And sorry, Thomas, that I keep talking here. The, the developer experience of using a GraphQL API and building a GraphQL API is absolutely fantastic, right? And so developers love it. I fell in love with GraphQL, like I said, at my last company. We were using GraphQL exclusively for all of our data access needs. And it's probably the part of our entire stack that worked by far the best. It was beautiful. We loved every second of using GraphQL, except for the fact that we couldn't cache it. That was the, that was the one big <laughs> problem that we ran into. But overall, it, from a GraphQL perspective, from a framework perspective, it worked beautifully for our system. And so I think GraphQL is one of those technologies that, kept, that just keeps growing on its own because developers try it, they realize, oh, wow, this feels really nice to use. And then they just keep using it and they keep building more and more GraphQL APIs. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I, I will agree as one of those converts. It took me a long time, a longer than it should have to really invest in learning GraphQL. And I spent a lot of time messing with REST APIs, building REST APIs and Express, extending WordPress REST API. And then I just kind of, finally, I was like, I saw, I'll, I'll say it, I saw the light. And I was just like, wow, this is really fantastic and just saves me a lot of headache from, like you mentioned, the waterfall requests were always annoying. Or alternatively, what I would find myself doing was creating my own REST API endpoints that weren't very RESTful where it would essentially return me the JSON that I wanted, but it wasn't necessarily like a REST API because it was multiple entities constructed together. And then at that point, I'm like, well, why am I, I'm like abusing this thing over here where there's this other purpose made thing that will give me what I want in one request. So, so maybe I should just use that. Um, and I also love to see at the same time, like I like, I like it when technologies have like a low barrier and then a high yes. ceiling, right? And so I feel like the more and more we see of this unification of making things easier to integrate, like it just removes so much of the headache of a developer's day-to-day -day job. And if I can just plug into this one source and get data across all of these things to integrate nicely, like that's, that's amazing. And it's going to make me super productive. I mean, low barrier is a, a thing, especially in the unification of that graph, graphical IDE, because guys, just a funny quick story. My mom came to visit over the weekend and she saw me playing with our very own Jason's Balls WP GraphQL Smart Cache. And she's like, friend, what are you doing? You keep hit, hitting the browser to get your cache hits. <laughs> And she's like, you love your job too much. I was like, mom, come, come, come. Let me show you something. 
I made her pull up the query code <clears throat> and she wrote a GraphQL query just by clicking on the put. And she's like, friend, what am I doing? I'm like, mom, press play. And she's like, oh, that's the content I wrote. And she got so yeah. happy and she had a glass of wine. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. and, and, and that's another thing I think also that makes GraphQL really approachable. It's like you have tools like graphical where you can come and visually compose a query. Yeah. And then it's not like you You're just take that not. query and send it off, you know, via post request. And there's yeah. not a ton of mental gymnastics you need to, to make that work. Um, but so let's, let's, we touched on this a little bit already. So I'm going to sort of combine a couple of questions here. So we touched on the fact that you all released a WordPress plugin to support the, the Stellate uh, Edge, Edge CDN. Uh, specifically for WordPress users. So clearly the number of people that are using WordPress and GraphQL is large enough for a company like yours to devote development time to creating that plugin. So we'd be interested to know, like from your perspective, what is the headless development landscape with WordPress look like? What have you heard from users? What patterns do you see? And then maybe how could uh, that ecosystem improve uh, to make WordPress a little more competitive with other headless first CMSs like sanity or uh strappy contentful even yeah contentful yeah it's a great question thomas how about you walk us through a little bit what the stellate wordpress plugin does and then i can go a little bit into how we see the headless wordpress landscape from our perspective first thing um i think maybe to start off why did we even build or decided to build the plugin yeah that's uh, great. I mean, we didn't like uh like look into the, the glass uh, ball and uh, WordPress came out of it. Oh, okay. uh, we yeah. actually looked at our users, uh, at our user base and uh, did a research of like, what are these APIs that, uh, that create a service at Stellate? And we actually found out that quite a lot of them were uh, using WordPress GraphQL. Um, wow. Like even, like, like it was the top, uh, I think, the, the, the top one uh, we also looked at uh, something like Azura had uh, had a lot of uh, services at Stellate, but the top one was actually WordPress GraphQL. Oh wow! Um, and that's basically also why we decided in the first place to build this uh, integration to make it easier for those folks to to uh, use our uh, GraphQL Edge Cache, um, because like that clearly told us that uh, there there is like a need for this and users want mm -hmm. this um, so that's why we actually built our plugin and basically to to reiterate what what does our plugin actually do um, i mentioned uh, previously the the two different ways of how you can invalidate your cache um, one of them being automated invalidations which work nice if you use mutations the other one uh, is like our purging api and if you use wordpress uh, it's likely also if you use it headless in a, a headless WordPress that you'll use the WordPress dashboard to edit your blog posts uh, and stuff like that. Um, and our plugin makes it like uh, by default, once you change anything, could be like a blog post uh, or even custom types, custom taxonomies, all the things that you can do in WordPress, all the like different data types. Once you change anything about any of those, we automatically uh, invalidate the cache at our Stellet service for it. So you only like, it's really like you, you install the plugin, you enter your service name, you enter mm -hmm. a purging token to authenticate with our purging API and that's it, like you're done. Um, <laughs> that's, that's all you need to do. Uh, that's That was the goal for us to make it as easy as possible to um, integrate between uh, WordPress GraphQL and uh, Stellate. Oh, that's fantastic. And the numbers don't lie, huh? That's no. that's great to hear no. that there's that much kind of groundswell uh, behind this. So It's interesting cool. because I think like at, at the end of the day, whether you like it or not, uh, WordPress is about like close to 40% of the <laughs> of the web. Yeah. The web, it's been around yeah. so damn long. It's so easy to use. And another cockroach. You it's will another never cockroach, this. right? It's another cockroach. However, however, I think again, like with with minds like yours, Max and Thomas, and like companies like WP Engine Stellate that continue to like essentially make, if you will, decoupled 
modern web development, Jamstack, whatever you want to call it, because I, this is essentially where the future is going to go of the web. We're, we're helping bring WordPress along essentially with a lower barrier of friction. So thank you for creating that blog. Yeah, uh, that for sure. Uh, I appreciate you guys. That's great. Let's see. I'd probably oh, it, unmute myself if I wanted to speak, man. Uh, this, this, whole, this whole Zoom thing, you'd think after all these years, I'd, I'd be used to unmuting myself in Zoom before speaking. Um, this, I'm, I'm actually curious, from, from WP Engine's perspective, what's the advantage for, for people listening who are using WordPress? Why do they use headless WordPress? Where does that really fit into the headless WordPress stack? Now, I have a rough idea of why that is, but I'm curious what that looks like within the WordPress community, since we really, really are coming to this from the graphical side of things, right? We're really coming to this from, hey, lots of people, we see lots of people using WordPress GraphQL to fetch from their WordPress API. Why are they doing that? What are they using it for? What, what have you learned at WP Engine about sort of the headless WordPress market? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do, and you've touched on this as well, with the idea of developer experience and what that looks like. And then the other portion of it, I think, is that we've watched so much innovation happen in the front end framework space. And like I was just looking at like the Remix framework, for example, and kind of comparing that with Next.js and all of the built in technology that just comes core in those frameworks is like, I mean, you get really nice performant websites like you have link prefetching built in. You have all of these mechanisms to create these really amazing experiences and I don't want to say that you can't make fast and performant websites in traditional WordPress, but the way you do that is fundamentally different. Like link prefetching in Next.js is pretty much turned on out of the box, right? They've said, hey, this is, this is something that we're going to opt into at the core level, and you're going to have fast websites. If a user hovers over this link or scrolls it into the viewport, we're going to load this data in the background. Where it's like WordPress, I've got to go make that intentional decision and then turn on a plugin if there is one to like enable some of these performance benefits. And so from my perspective, at least that, that seems to be a lot of what's driving this. And then I do think there is also, um, like Fran said, it's just, it's kind of, it's kind of the future, you know, like, and I think there are a lot of people who are starting to, to realize that and saying, okay, well, I get it that WordPress as a whole maybe isn't trending in this direction, uh, in terms of core, but you have all of these other companies that are moving this way. You have headless CMS companies raising lots of money. Like obviously you all are getting into this space because you see this decoupled sort of federated content approach um, being, being more and more the norm. And I think the third thing that I would mention is just like it, it does and again, we can do this in traditional WordPress and PHP as well, you know, so like, but it does make it a little bit easier to knit together all of these different data sources. So if I have my content CDN and I'm using a CMS like Shopify, then maybe I've got some external service over here that I also want to integrate. We can do that um, in, in, in JavaScript. And I think that has a lot to do with it, right? Because you see most of these consumer facing APIs sort of become JavaScript first. And so, well, obviously transacting in JavaScript, I think is a little bit more comfortable for some folks. Yeah, and I'll add on to that. I think just just from a, Jeff does say, Jeff, you nailed it. You could, you could look at the end of the day, you could take a monolithic WordPress site and then you can get aggressively cashy, if you will, on the edge layer, just cache those pages aggressively. However, however, I believe, and just because I've, I'm all about the jam stack, jam stoke, but I think that at the end of the day, decoupling and do going headless is much more performant and also much more secure. That's that's the obvious reason because there's big, big enterprise level companies that still use WordPress as their CMS because their marketers don't want to code. They just want to fill in that block editor and then their dev team can just go on with Vue, Angular, React, mm -hmm. Svelte, whatever right and then optimize that user ux on the on the front end ui that's that's the power of that is that it future proofs your wordpress back end is i is is my is my take on it because if you stay monolithic and you're not a small mom and pop i'm going to tell you i think this is just my business opinion your website and your web property your digital property is going to be left in the dust it's going, to be, it's going to be a bad user experience for your users accessing it on different nodes, and you're going to lose money. That's, that's, that's my take. 
And that's why I think, you know, this is, I think this is very valuable in, in what offering both tools, if you will, for, for the web developer, because if you have an agency guys, or if you're on your own business, it depends, right? You could still use monolithic, you know, but it's just like a small, it's a get small site, get small visits. When you're huge enterprise organizations, even mid-level business that gets some kind of dynamic traffic, I, I, I mean, I, I would, I would hate, I would not put that on a monolithic stack. But it's just my. I think opinion. that's that's really the thing we hear is content editors. They love WordPress. They're used to using it as a, as a CMS. I mean, there's a reason they power such a large percentage of the web, right? Content editors absolutely love using WordPress. They're used to it. They know how to use it. They've got all their plugins set up. They've got, they've got their custom workflow set up. They, their whatever editorial approval workflow, doesn't matter. They've got it all set up in WordPress, but developers love GraphQL and they love working in a headless architecture for all the benefits that that brings. And so in a way, WordPress GraphQL brings the best of those worlds together, right? The content editors can keep using WordPress, the CMS they know and love, and developers can use the modern technologies that they know and love to build really performant websites. And I think really to, to sort of take a step back that we're, we're really where Stellate's edge cache comes in is that it just makes that WordPress graphical layer ever faster and reduces the load on your server, right? Because our um, P95 response time for cache hits across the globe is about 50 milliseconds, right? So if something's in the cache within 50 milliseconds, that'll be served to your users, right? Which comparing to most GraphQL APIs, those take up to a second to respond to any query, right? And so really we're speeding up people's APIs massively. And of course, not all the users are sitting in one space, right? You'll have your WordPress server hosted probably in Virginia, which is the classic data center, right? US classic. East 1, mm -hmm. classic Virginia US data center one. where everything is, right? And so you, you, you'll have your, 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 um, your servers in that place. You'll have your API in that place. But then a user fetches your blog post from Europe or even Australia, it's going to take a while before they can look at it, right? And it's not even because your server is slow. It's just because you're going a long way, man. You're going halfway across the world and back every single time. And so really with us, just globally, you get that 50 millisecond response time and it's so much faster. And then, of course, for every cache, we don't have to hit your server anymore. And so for use cases like WordPress, where the data is relatively static, right? Most people use it for data that doesn't change that frequently compared yeah. to, for example, a mm -hmm. stock service, uh, some 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 th the data of some stocks, and so our our WordPress customers are sitting some of them at a ninety nine percent cache hit rate, right? Like ninety nine percent of their API requests are served from our edge cache rather than having to go to the server. And so you can imagine what that does for your performance, right? Rather than having to wait a second every single time to get data, you're waiting fifty milliseconds in ninety nine percent of cases. Like that is going to be such a better experience for your users, and that's really where we come in, right? And that's really the the, the part that was missing in the space. Man, this is yeah. this is awesome. You guys are filling a huge gap. For sure. And I will say too, like a part of that has to do, I think with <clears throat> WordPress infrastructure, because when you think about people, how those machines are optimized and what they're optimized for, if you have something on a, I'll say a hosting plan that isn't optimized for headless WordPress out there, you know, like that is optimized for caching pages, page requests. And so if you have 196 pages and you run a Gatsby build against that, you know, that, that may not end well against yeah. your, your tiny shared WordPress yeah. hosted server uh, somewhere else. So it does sort of enable, um, you know, a lot of optimization at a different layer of the stack that I think is like underserved right now uh, by a lot of the different hosting providers out there. We um, have, um, I was just going to say just a time check in respect to Thomas's and uh, Matt, sure. we have about five minutes. Um, and I always like to ask an ending fun question at the end of this podcast, because as a developer, I know our we get stoked, right? Our excitement is the dopamine hit that when our code works or a GraphQL request or cached, and we're like, yeah, it's rendering on the browser, woo! And then I don't want to work for three days because I've been staring at code for. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start with Max. Max, other than coding GraphQL and. What do you do to unwind and like clear your head for fun? Do you do you rock climb? Do you mountain bike? Do you swim? Go. Great question. So I'm really into uh, table tennis. I'm really into rock climbing. I'm really into coffee. Okay. And I'm really into skiing. Those are some of the things I do pretty frequently. Oh, I'm, it's funny that you bring up rock climbing. I actually got into bouldering about two years ago, just before COVID hit, and I've been loving it. Just going to the gym every week, just climbing with my friends. I freaking love it, man. It's such a great way to wind down, connect with people. Just super fun. I love it. Max, 
You and you I just made a new best, best friend. friend. <laughs> Rock climber for six years. I, I do sport and bouldering. Nice. Um, when you come to Austin, I'll take you to Austin Bouldering Project. It's a oh, hell yeah. thirty thousand foot square um, foot gym, and we we have routes set every week. Um, and nice. yeah, we can boulder, grab a beer, and maybe write some GraphQL requests. Oh hell yeah! Let's do, <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that. That sounds amazing. Uh, I'm like an amazing. I'll definitely game. join you for that. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. How about you, Thomas? <laughs> uh, I also did like. Uh, but for me, rock climbing, not that more anymore, uh, like in the last two years. I did quite a lot of it, uh, actually, um, like sports climbing back in the day, some years ago. Um, I'm even oh, wow. more into skiing than Max. Um, <laughs> so, uh, oh, I'm wow. a skiing That's instructor, awesome. instructor. So I spent my winter teaching other people how to be skiing instructors. Um, and uh, in the summer, um, it's also enjoying mountains as, uh, as much as i can um, uh, that's awesome and I then do. it's hiking biking um these kind of things i, I get down on the winter sports y'all yeah y'all yeah, have to teach me how to rock climb but i'll come snowboarding that <laughs> nice. was one of my one of my bucket list things was to uh ski the Ger or snowboard the german alps and we crossed that off a couple a couple of years ago that was a lot of Definitely. fun Logistically speaking, out of curiosity, I'm just going to throw this out there. Next year for my vacation, uh, I'm going to be rock climbing. <laughs> I'm going to be rock climbing in Siriana, Spain. Uh, nice. Is it close? Spain to Austria? Pretty. It's probably like a two-hour flight. Oh, easy. Yeah. I wonder if it's really. Yeah, I think it's away. too long to drive. It, mm -hmm. uh, I drove once to Spain, and it took us like. I don't know, 20 hours plus. So, um, mm. but it's relatively close. I'm, uh, I'm, if you're flying, I, it's really just two hours. My mind is turning. Maybe I asked WP Engine to sponsor a GraphQL conference <laughs> in Suriana, Spain, but we there really not climb. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, the there first go. GraphQL request from I'm a coming. cliff. I'm coming, man. <laughs> yeah. We're not GraphQL even coding. We, we see uh, Max and I just folder. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of developers show up they're like why are we have what? What chalk bag and yeah like, <laughs> where's our laptop <laughs> uh, oh, anyway anyway yeah what well, a great this was one of my favorite podcasts y'all for sure Th thank you both for for your time and generosity and coming on here uh we had some great discussions about graphql stellate and sort of graphql at the edge um, so definitely we'll be sure to leave links to your company and to your all's profiles and in, in the show notes so that people can check you out. Um, and if, you know, we, we will definitely be in touch. Maybe, maybe y'all come on, uh, again, when you have some product news or something we'll to share. Have you back, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for having, having us. us. This was really fun. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. All right, friends until next time. Yep. Bye guys. Later. Bye. 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 -bye.